so in case you don't know who I am, I'm Aaron. <laughs> so uh, I've been going to this church for about six or seven months. Um, before that, it's actually the Power of Prayer kind of brought me here to Burlington, Vermont. Um, I was in New York, in the Adirondacks. I was working with a nonprofit doing content writing. Um, and I had heard about Burlington. I visited, and I could kind of sense uh, spiritual darkness that was uh, in Burlington. Um, I don't know if anybody can relate to that, but I could sense that. And um, Anyway, so I, I started praying with a couple other guys um, about coming to Burlington uh, to work with a church plan. And during that time, actually, this was like two years ago, I actually met up with Kevin because I was like trying investigating the area and uh, we talked about uh, stuff and learning about the area. And um, anyway, the other two guys, they eventually went to do other things. Um, but uh, during that time of prayer, it was weird. My, my parents went from Indiana to plant a church in South Burlington during this time of prayer without even having any prior discussion about Burlington. They just, it was like they, they went to Vermont. Uh, they were like, you know, I feel like God wants us to plant a church in Vermont. I was like, okay, that's cool. And then they went to South Burlington. So uh, that's just the power of prayer right there, just bringing family to win it here. Um, pretty incredible. But anyway, so then I was like, well, okay, I guess God is going to be in ministry here because my parents are here. And <laughs> I don't know, that's just kind of, I was like, well, it's my parents' territory. So, uh, so I kind of just like forgot about it. And, um, and then I got an opportunity to go to China, and I went there, taught English uh, with a... Uh, church school, so that was pretty cool. Three months there, then I got swallowed by a fish and spat up on the shores of Lake Champlain, kind of like Jonah, and uh, to come back here in ministry. So, anyways, uh, was it a fish or a whale? I'm not no, it was, a, it, it was not a whale. Okay, fish. Um, but anyways, so today, <laughs> um, so I, that's kind of like the reason why I'm here is to share the light of the gospel. Um, so, I, I figured, why not talk about that, the gospel, uh, today, uh, the reason why I'm here. Um, and I, so, one purpose of me sharing this is because I, I kind of hope it uh, reinvigorates my purpose for being here, you know, because I, I think I kind of lose sight of that so easily, why I'm here. And I hope it also equips you guys to uh, share the gospel and to know the gospel, and maybe you've never heard the gospel um, and so this will be a good chance for that. Welcome, Mobile Church. <laughs> um, so, uh, the main idea of the gospel, and kind of the main idea that I'm going to be building on throughout this message, is um, this, this, this short phrase. I kind of reduced the gospel to ten words. Uh, it's Christ died for your sins and rose from the dead. Okay, it's ten words, really quick summary. I didn't make that up, though. It actually came from Scripture, so, uh, so don't blame me for that. So, uh, we're actually going to look at that. It's going to be in 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 8. So, if, I think there's some Bibles around you guys if you want to check them out. Um, 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 8. If you don't know where 1 Corinthians is, uh, go to the New Testament. It's Matthew, then Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, Romans, and 1 Corinthians, and then chapter 15. So, I'll give you a moment to flip there. Already had a head start. I was already flipped there. So page oh, right, because you guys have the same Bibles. Okay. So seven five three is that what it was? Okay. Thanks, Kevin. Um. Anyways, so so here we're, I'm going to read it. I think you guys got ESVs, right? So we all got the same version here. So um, I'm going to go ahead and read it. Now I would actually wait before I read. It, I just want to do a little prayer so to bless that. Okay. Um. Dear God, I think it's time that, um, that you could use me as just a small part of the body to uh, help minister to people and build up people in uh, the truth of your word, the truth of your gospel, of your son Jesus. And so I just pray that you would fill me with words that are my own. Um, I don't want to preach my own doctrine or my own beliefs. I just want to preach what's in uh, your word, what you've said. Um, so I just pray that you would use me now to do that. And I pray that you would convict us all of, um, of what you want to convict us of, the truth. Um, so do that now for us, God. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. So, uh, 1 Corinthians 15. Now, I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preached to you, which you received, in which you stand, and by which you are being saved, if you hold fast to the word I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, 
that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve. Then he appeared no more, or to, he, then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. Last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared also to me. So, um, I, I think you can get those, see those ten words where I got them. Uh, Christ died for your sins and rose from the dead. I just took um, uh, the main elements of it, which was uh, in verse 3, that Christ died for our sins. And then verse 4, that he was raised again, raised from the dead. Um, so that's just basic basic summary of it. And we're going to get into the details of it, nitty gritty, and we're going to expand on it. So, um, so the key concepts, though, of the, of the ten words, the summary of what the gospel is, uh, is Christ. Okay, so we're going to break it down to three parts. Christ is that first part that we see there. So what is Christ? Uh, died for our sins. What does that even mean? And rose from the dead. Uh, so we're going to get delve into those elements. Um, so the first word, yeah, Christ. So what does that mean? I think, um, I don't know about you guys, I'm, I'm not going to assume anything on you. Maybe you probably already know this, maybe not. Um, but Christ wasn't Jesus' last name. It wasn't like Jesus, John, Christ, or anything. It was, uh, Christ was, is a title, actually. Um, because back then people were distinguished by their trade, uh, their passion, the place where they came from. Uh, they didn't have really last names, at least in that area. I don't know if other parts of the world did. Um, so that's why you had people like Demetrius the Silversmith, uh, Simon the Zealot, uh, the Zealot Jesus of Nazareth. Uh, that's another thing Jesus was referred to as. Um, but uh, we mostly know Jesus as Jesus Christ because of this title he has. And what does Christ mean? It means the Messiah. Maybe you've heard the, the word the Messiah. Um, that, that means the anointed one or the chosen one. Uh, you kind of see this idea sometimes in popular culture where you get uh, people like Anakin Skywalker in Star Wars, where he's, you know, the chosen one, chosen one, chosen one. And uh, he was chosen to do some awesome thing. And, um, and as it, that's, just a, that's just coming straight from Scripture. I think George Lucas, like, just looked at the Bible and he was like, I, I think he actually did. I think I heard about that. Yeah, uh, you know, Heidi? I think you're, oh, okay. <laughs> you were going to me look like, I thought you were going like this. Okay. Um, but I'm pretty sure I did that. So... <laughs> I thought we were on the same page for a second. I was like, yeah, I got something to prove it. Okay. okay. George is like, oh, come on. Okay. <laughs> I, thought, I thought it was a popular culture reference. Not everybody can be a Star Wars I had to put at least one Star Wars reference in my past, in my uh, sermon here. <laughs> so, um, okay, so, yeah, so that's what the idea behind the Christ, that he was the chosen one. Um, and this, was, this goes all the way back to prophecies uh, that were told about Jesus, um, that he would be the chosen one uh, to save the world. We'll get into that. Um, so, the Messianic prophecies um, that Jesus would be, are of the Messiah, okay, the Christ, uh, they date back, really, to since the beginning. Um, we actually see in Genesis 3.15, uh, where Jesus... Uh, or where, sorry, where God says to Adam uh, that he would have a seed, okay? And so that's where we see the first elements of maybe of this idea that there would be something coming. Uh, it was a little vague at that point, but it got more and more clear as we see with Abraham. In uh, Genesis 12, 3, we see where God promised Abraham that he would have a seed that would bless the entire world. And this promise was passed down from Abraham to his son, to his son. Um, and it became these promises of this Messiah that would come became more and more clear um, as we get down to the prophets, okay? So, um, so the prophets, there were these guys like Jeremiah, Isaiah, who had these really clear um, words from God about what uh, the Messiah would be like. Is God calling? I hate it when people do throw out the joke when there's like a like a phone ringing and they're like, "Oh, is God calling?" Anyways, I just had to throw that out there. Um, but anyway, um, so um, yeah, so so one. Uh, I think there's a really clear passage in Isaiah uh, that pulls out this idea of the Messiah. It's Isaiah 40, 
verse 3. You can flip there if you want. I have it written down here, so I can, you can just listen or you can read it. Isaiah 40, verse 3. And Isaiah 40, verse 3 says, The voice of him that crieth in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Okay, so in the prop, it got really quiet in here all of a sudden. So, <laughs> so um, in, in the prophets, we see these certain elements about the Messiah being foretold, okay? Um, and here we see one of those elements. The voice of him that cried in the wilderness, prepare ye the way of the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Now, it's interesting that he kind of pulls, pulls this idea because Isaiah, he was just talking about the Messiah, and then all of a sudden he's saying, make straight uh, in the desert a highway for our God. So he's equating the Messiah with God. He's saying that they are one and the same. Um, if you're like, uh, Aaron, I'm a little skeptical. That doesn't sound very clear to me. Well, flip over to Isaiah verse, uh, chapter 9, verse 6. You'll see something a little more clear. So Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6. And you can flip over there, but I'll read it. It says, For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. And so, um, so he says clearly here that his name will be called Mighty God, uh, Everlasting Father. He's, he's equating the Messiah uh, with God. Um, and so he, even back, because this is actually literally, I, I was making this message and I, I like asked my mom, I was like, Mother. Um, <laughs> she's, like, she's like a Bible whiz, okay? She's a Bible whiz. So uh, I was like, did, how, did the Old Testament scriptures ever say that the Messiah would be God, because that sounds like something like, did we Christians just make that up? And she was like, uh, read Isaiah 40 and Isaiah, and like, she just, I was like, oh, <laughs> like, she, she knows prophecy. So, anyway, um, so, yeah, it's pretty clear that um, the Messiah would be God. Um, so, uh, there's another thing, that, so, there, there's the prophecies, and um, that kind of go along with, you know, uh, 1 Corinthians 15, where it said that, um, that Christ died for sins, according with the scriptures, okay? So I'm relating these according with the scriptures back to the scriptures, okay? That's what, I'm, that's what I've been doing. I don't know if you guys caught that. I'm a little, I'm going a little fast. Yeah, you caught it. Thanks, Phil. So, um, uh, so John, um, moving on to the New Testament, uh, he was also equating the Messiah, Jesus, with God. Uh, we can see in John 1, this is where um, he really just, at the very beginning, he just lays it out. He's like, guys, I'll, I'll love with you. I'll be honest with you about what I believe about Jesus. Um, so let's just read John 1. Um, I'm just going to read, like, the whole thing. No, I'm kidding. Uh, verses 1 through 14. Okay, John 1, 1 through 14. That's Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. So I think it's, uh, it's the fourth book in the New Testament. Okay. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Okay, so I, I just have to pause there for a second because that's pretty weird. Right? Um, so, first of all, the word, uh, this is what John is referring to Jesus as, the word. Um, I know you guys probably don't care about Greek, but that means lo- the Greek word for that is logos. Basically, it means the expression. And so, Jesus, John was identifying Jesus as this expression of God. And um, he was saying, so there's a couple of things that he says there. In the beginning was the word, okay? So, even from the beginning, Jesus was there, okay? Um, and the word was with God, and the word was God. Now, I don't know, is that confusing to you guys? Because how can you be with somebody and was somebody? Because I, I don't know about you, but I, I wasn't with Frank and also was Frank. You, you, how do you do that? It's, um, and, and so he's kind of pre- presenting us a really weird idea um, that doesn't normally fit with the way we think. I mean, um, so it's, it's pretty... So I think that's, you get into the whole, you know, Trinity thing that's pretty, like, complicated, but I won't go there. Um, but I'll just point that out. It was God and was with God. Strange. Um, anyway, and so, um, moving on, verse 2. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. Now, I think that's, I'm sorry, I keep stopping, but it's just exciting, the scripture, you know, that kind of gets to me when I'm reading it. So, um, there's, uh, I think we should camp on that for a second, because um, he said all things were made through him, okay, and without him nothing was made. So, 
Um, John, he's really kind of doing, he's doing some interesting things here. Um, because the thing is that there, there's, uh, John was kind of like directing this at some people at that time who believed certain things about, and were saying certain teachings about Jesus that weren't true. Um, they were saying, first of all, that he was a created being. And so John kind of here, he was kind of like addressing that. He was saying, oh, no, 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 uh, through Jesus, everything was created and nothing was created without him. So actually, uh, you, you know, you can't have, you can't have something, how can you create Jesus if nothing was created without him? Everything was created. So he would have to fall into the category of everything, but nothing was created without him. So I hope that's clear to you guys as it is to me. Um, so, uh, so John was kind of like doing like a, like a screw to the Gnostics at the time, you know. He was just like, uh, no, actually, um, uh, Jesus was not created. Um, and so, uh, the next verse, life was light. Okay, verse four. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to bear witness about the light, that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but came to bear witness about the light. The true light, this is verse 9, the true light, which gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him. Yet the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. So, I, I think that's pretty uh, shocking right there, that we're kind of getting this picture. That Jesus is the creator, right? He, everything was created through him. He, he's the creator and he comes to the earth and his own creation rejects him, is what he's saying right there. Everything was made through him and the world did not know him. Um, he came to his own people and did not, they did not receive him. So it's kind of like the toy master going to his toy land and the toys rejecting him and saying, uh, we don't know you, who are you, stay back. And... Um, and then, and then it's kind of a double whammy, though, because he didn't just go to his creation. He went to his chosen people, the Israelites. Because back in the Old Testament, God chose Israel to be his people to represent to the world his message. And when he, so he chose them long ago, and now he's coming to them, Jesus, and they reject him. So it's this double whammy that not only does creation reject him, but also his chosen people rejected him. Um, okay, moving on. Uh, Verse 12, but to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, who were born not of blood, nor the will of the flesh, nor the will of man, but of God. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory, glory as the only son from the Father, full of grace and truth. So, so that's, there's, another, there's another kind of mic drop from John. Uh, he's saying, and the word became flesh. So, so this was another thing. You know, I, I mentioned those people that were saying different things about Jesus that John felt like he had to address. Um, he, was, he says the word became flesh because a lot of the people back then, the Gnostics, this group of guys, um, they were like, oh, actually, Jesus, uh, he wasn't physical. He wasn't like real. He was just a spiritual, a spirit that came to the earth and pretended to be real and pretended to die. He didn't actually die because how can you kill God? That was their reasoning. Makes sense, right? Like, how can you kill God if you can't? So he would have to have been spiritual and just faked his death. Um, but John's like, no, he became flesh and dwelt among us and we've seen his glory. Um, and this is, this is the, a, a basic thing that really John loves to hammer on throughout his, throughout his books. Um, like, you get, to the, you get to the end of John and you have all the disciples like poking at Jesus' uh, flesh wounds, his, the holes in his hands and the hole in his side from when he was pierced through with a spear. Um, he, he was emphasizing, this is a physical guy. He ate fish with us after he was raised from the dead. Um, so it's, it's, a, it's a really big emphasis um, from John. Um, anyway, so, so basically what we get from these, these pictures that I'm kind of throwing at you guys, <laughs> um, is that the Christ was the Messiah, the, the one who's foretold in the Old Testament scriptures, um, and that he was also God um, who came down in flesh. Um, okay, so that's, that's the first element of this whole Christ died for our sins and rose from the dead, Christ. So now you know who, who this guy is that we're dealing with, Christ. Um, 
So moving on to my second page of notes. So you guys can kind of tell I'm, I've got, what, like four pages here? Don't worry about that fourth page. This is a personal thing. So um, there only two in like, like an like a eighth. So, um, so uh, what's the second part about dying for our sins, right? Christ died for our sins. Uh, let's, let's delve into that. Um, so one thing that in our original passage, uh, 1 Corinthians 15, that he says about it, he said that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures. So let's just focus on that, uh, on the Old Testament uh, prophecies that, were, that discussed how he would die for our sins. Um, because if you ask uh, a lot of Jews, a lot of Jewish people will say that the Messiah, you know, he, they might disagree with this idea that he was going to die for our sins. Um, and this is a good passage, Isaiah 53, uh, that really points out um, how, how he was going to do this, that it was, it was purpose that he's going to die for our sins. Um, so Isaiah 53, verses 4 through 6. If you notice, a lot of these prophecies are coming out of Isaiah. He was the man. Isaiah 53, verses 4 through 6. I'm going to read it. Um, Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace, and with his wounds we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Um, so his death was essentially our life, and all our sins were laid on him. He was, he was this, it's, it's this picture that's throughout the Old Testament of, of the lamb Right, the, uh, the sacrificial lamb. They made. They did a lot of sacrifices in the Old Testament, of a lamb who was slaughtered for the sins of the whole people. Um, that their sins were, in all practices and purposes, put on this. It was a symbol, but um, put on this lamb to show that their sins were taken off of them and put onto something else. And so this is this is a picture that's ever present throughout the Old Testament, and and Jesus was the fulfillment of this. He was the ultimate sacrifice that all of our sins were placed on him, and that when he died, he died for our sins. That's what it means that he died for our sins. Um, okay, so so why did, maybe we don't understand this concept of sins. Like, why did Jesus have to do that, this our sins part? Um, so uh, th this, is, um, this is really the problem that Christ came to fix. Um, okay, so I'm just going to hit a few verses um, Romans 3.23 kind of discusses our main problem. Uh, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. That's Romans 3.23. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Um, and so notice that, that all part, you know, it's kind of all-encompassing. Um, so there's not really anybody exempted from that. Um, and, but, but then he kind of says for everybody's sin and um, everybody falls short of God's glory. So, so apparently there's this like standard of God's glory, his perfection, his, um, his holiness. And it's kind of like, it's kind of like there's this awesome ride that you want to go into, like in a park, right? And, and, but there's like, you know, there's the, the height, you have to be so tall. I always was able to get into those rides, by the way. And, um, but there, there's like this like super high, it's like, it's like God's like, okay, you want to get the ride? You want to get the ride? And we're like, yeah. <laughs> and he's like, sorry, <laughs> God's glory. <laughs> so it's like, um, like God's glory. So we're talking about like, I can't even see the line, the, the red line that goes, this thing's so high. So, um, so it's just this incredibly high standard that we cannot uh, attain to. And, um, and uh, I, I think that to, to that, somebody might be like, um, actually, Aaron, you don't know me. <laughs> uh, I, I, can, uh, I can attain to that uh, because I can do a lot of good things. Uh, I, I'm actually a good, decent person. Um, and uh, I, I beg to differ. Um, <laughs> but, um, so the, the thing is that the scripture actually says, it kind of anticipates that. And it says in Romans, so I just quoted 3.23 in Romans. A few verses earlier in verses 10 through 12. Um, it says that there's nothing that we can do to not be sinful. Um, it says, there is none righteous, no, not one. No one understands, no one seeks for God. All have turned aside. Together they become worthless. No one does good, 
not even one. That's pretty like, kind of like soured my mood, right? Like, uh, no one, no one, no one does good. We're all, like, it's kind of like, you know, you don't want to hear that in a pep rally. <laughs> um, uh, nobody really likes saying that, you know? Um, it's not the positive message. Um, but, um, so, so the idea, though, is that we're hopelessly sinful. And it doesn't matter if you're as spiritually high as Mother Teresa or Bob Marley. I just threw that in a high reference, sorry. Um, but uh, I was kind of, uh, I was hoping I'd get some laughs and I didn't really do it much of an effect. But, okay, you, guys, you like that, Marcus? Okay, thank you, Marcus. <laughs> um, so, uh, so yeah, the, the idea is that we're hopelessly sinful. Um, and we can't attain to goodness. Um, and so, so the idea, so, so then three chapters later, in Romans, Romans 6.23, um, Paul writes, for the wages of sin is death. Okay, so we just clear all of sin, and there's no way that we can do anything. And the wages, okay, so the payment, um, I make a very small wage at Home Depot, by the way. But, um, but, but the wages of our, of our wrongdoing, our sin, is death. Um, and so, so maybe you're like, well, okay, Aaron, but uh, everybody dies. So, I mean, are you saying, like, so nobody's saved ever, right? Is that what you're suggesting? That's not what I'm suggesting, okay? Don't think that. Um, so the wages of sin is death, but it's talking about um, a different kind of death. It's not talking about, because after our heart stops, that's when true life begins or true death. Um, and we can experience true life and true death even when we're alive, but um, we're going to see the like true manifestation of true life or true death, eternal life or everlasting death. That sounds really bad, but... Um, um, so, and uh, there's actually a description of this true death. If you actually want to look at it, it's in 2 Thessalonians. Um, I think it's worth visiting. 2 Thessalonians, chapter 1. Uh, not that none of these were worth visiting. They were all worth visiting. That's why we visited them. Um, so 2 Thessalonians, chapter 1. And it's in verse 7 through 9. I'm going to read like halfway from verse 7. Uh, so... Verse 7 through 9 of chapter 1 in 2 Thessalonians. And it says, <clears throat> When the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, inflicting vengeance on those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus, they will suffer the punishment of eternal destruction away from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his might. So, it's a pretty, um, pretty dark verse. Uh, they will suffer the punishment. The people who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus, they will suffer the punishment of eternal destruction, away from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of His might. And I, I think it's, um, it's just super interesting that this, descrip this description of true death um, that is kind of there, it's, it's, uh, you know, it's this idea of being under the wrath of Christ, which you know, I, I typically think of Jesus as, Loving, but there's also this element that when he returns, there's this wrath that he's going to, you know, take out on the world the, of the, those who do not know God. I'm quoting this, you know. Um, dude, don't blame me; it's right there. Um, and and, um, and and then there's this idea of eternal destruction that death is not a moment; it's something that can last forever. Um, and but and but but then he, he does this crazy thing. The author of Thessalonians, which is Paul, by the way. Um, he does this crazy thing, which is to um, highlight how awful death is. It, it's not just like, he doesn't say, and then you're going to burn in hell forever, you know? Like, which is normally what Christians like to say, you know, you're going to burn in hell forever. But, but what he emphasizes is actually separation from the presence of the Lord and the glory of his might. He's saying that the worst thing that could happen to you is to be separated from Jesus and from his glory. That is the worst thing that could happen to you. And that's going to happen to you for eternity if you do not believe in the gospel of Jesus Christ. And, and, um, and which is, you know, I, we can't understand that because we haven't um, had complete union with Christ like, like Adam did. Um, um, not until we, you know, our heart stops and then we're with him. Um, but it, it is this, it's actually a terrible thing to be 
separated from your creator, you know? Uh, I mean, how do we expect to have life without him? He's the one who breathed life into us. In, in Genesis, when he created man, he breathed life into us. And so can we, we expect, because I, I, I think a lot, of, a lot of people will say, why doesn't God just leave us alone? You know, why does he have to throw us into hell? Why can't he just let us be, you know? Just kind of like, okay, you guys want to do your own thing, I understand, so I'll leave you over here. But to, to do that, to be separated from the creator, is death. So, uh, to, so when we, does that make sense? <laughs> I mean, there's no, no clearer than that. To be separated from the one who gives us life is death. We cannot live without him. We cannot experience true joy. Uh, or life. And um, so, um, it's pretty, pretty serious. Um, so now, uh, you, you notice that in that verse, I kind of mentioned that uh, who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus. So there's this sense of obedience implied uh, in the gospel. And that's an important part. We'll get to that later. So just kind of take a note there. Um, but, uh, okay, so the next thing that I want to talk about was what exactly did Jesus do? He says in, back in our main passage, 1 Corinthians 15, that he, um, that he rose again, or, or sorry, it says that he died according to the scriptures. Um, and so, so let's get more into that about what the Old Testament said. Um, so I, I don't want I, I to go over to all the verses, but there's like so many great verses that prophesied exactly how Jesus would live and how he would die. Um, and what's kind of highlighted is how he would die in this passage, but they also said how he would live. And um, for example, they said, it says in the Old Testament that they would gamble for his clothes. It says that he would be pierced through his side. It says that he would have no broken bones when he died, which was interesting because when they were crucified, they typically broke their legs so, so they could stop breathing. But Jesus, they didn't do that because he was dead already. Um, and it also says that he would be buried with the rich. Joseph of Arimathea took Jesus' body and he put it in his grave. And he was a rich guy. Um, and also it said that he would be raised on a tree, and which is what he was on the cross. Um, but one, one verse that I do want to get into is Psalms 22 verse 1, um, which kind of just highlights how he died for our sins. I think this is incredible. Um, so Psalms 22, verse 1. Actually, I've written down here, but uh, if you want to see it, Psalms 22, verse 1. <clears throat> Sorry, I'm repeating that so much, but I just want to get into your heads in case you want to think about it later. So Psalms 22, verse 1. Um, it says, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Oh, are, are we, wait, did we switch to the New Testament? Because I thought Jesus said that. He did. Uh, but this is the Old Testament. <laughs> so, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me from the words of my groaning? Oh my God, I cry by day, but you do not answer. And by night, but I find no rest. And one of Jesus' last words, um, he said, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And he was, so what, what happened in that moment? In that moment, Jesus was, you know, all the suffering that Jesus went through, and it's, I don't know if you know the whole crucifixion story, I won't get into that, but he went through torture, um, and rejection by his people, but on the cross, he, he experienced the climax of his suffering, which is to be separated from God. And that's why he said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And which, this should blow your mind, by the way, because this isn't just, you know, one of us being separated from him. This is the guy who we just said was with God from the beginning, and was with him and was him. So we're talking about some super close relationship that we can't even understand, that somehow for a moment they were separated, that God turned his face from Jesus. And so, so this, is, this, this, was, this was death. You know, the death I was talking about, being separated from the glory of God. This is what Jesus experienced on the cross. He actually died in that spiritual sense of being separated from God. And, and this is the worst thing for Jesus because he's been attached to this guy for eternity. Um, and so... Uh, so why did he do that? He did that so that we wouldn't have to experience the punishment for our sins, you know, which we said the wages of sin is death. So that he died so that we would not have to take, that we would not have to experience that punishment. Um, so, um, so the, and, and that's, the, that's the essence of that Christ died for our sins um, and, that, and that he rose from the dead. 
Um, and so that's, that's the, the second part, though, that he didn't stay dead, um, as per according to the scriptures, actually, because he rose from the dead according to the scriptures, what it says. And there's a verse, Psalm 1610, um, that says, For you will not abandon my soul to Sheol, nor will you allow your Holy One to undergo decay. Psalm 16, verse 10. Psalm 16, verse 10. You might want to look it up later. So, it's, it's pretty good. So, for you will not abandon my soul to Sheol, nor will you allow your Holy One to undergo decay. And um, I think when a lot of people first read that, they don't realize it's actually the Messiah it's talking about. It's actually Jesus. Um, but he would not allow God or Jesus to undergo decay. And that's when he was raised three days later from the tomb. And he defeated death. He defeated, killed it, beat it, kicked it. And, and death was defeated. Uh, death no longer has to have power over us uh, because of Jesus taking on that punishment for us, taking on death for us. Um, and so, so I'll get into more of that, but, um, and rose from the dead. So then 1 Corinthians 15, he goes into this whole spiel about how there's a bunch of witnesses, which did you guys know that 500 witnesses saw the resurrected Jesus? I mean, that's pretty convincing. Like, if somebody saw 500 people, or if 500 people saw somebody raised from the dead today, I think we'd have to believe it. But uh, we don't believe it because it's Bible. You know, it's an old book. Um, but, um, but yeah, 500 people saw Jesus, the resurrected Jesus, and the disciples themselves, they, they touched the places where the nails were, the holes, they touched the side. Uh, it's a reality. It actually happened. He actually rose from the dead. Laying out there. So, um, and, and so, yeah, a lot of times we say nowadays, if, if I could only just see Jesus, you know, you're, what you're saying is so good to me, but if I could just see Jesus, or if he would come to me or reveal himself to me, then I would believe. Um, well, he's already been seen, though, by hundreds of people, 500 people. And it's kind of, it's kind of arrogant for us to think, well, I want him to appear to me, though. <laughs> you know, like me. Uh, why, why do you think you're so special that Jesus would have to appear to you after he's already made such a demonstration of his power. He's already given you so much proof through all these hundreds of witnesses. Um, and, and I think, I think that's arrogant. I think, it's, I think it's ignorant to think that Jesus would appear to every generation even. You know what I mean? It's like, like is he going to, he already appeared once, but to expect him maybe like every 25 years on the calendar to appear so then we can like, okay, now we believe. And then new generation comes, we don't believe. Oh, he came, okay, he's coming again. So um, anyway, um, so because of Jesus' death, um, which has been witnessed by all these people, now we have true life. Romans 6. By the way, what, what time? Am I going like way over time? Or is it? Oh, okay. That's over time, but <laughs> that's over time for that. So uh, Romans 6. I got time. <laughs> um, so Romans 6. Uh, I'm actually just finishing up. See, like, look how much I've got on this. I'm like, I'm right here. So we're like, we're, we're, getting, we're going along. Um, Romans 6, Romans 6. We're going to start at verse 4. It's awesome. Romans 6, verse 4. Romans 6, verse 4. <laughs> um, and we're going to read through verse 11. <clears throat> and this is just going to highlight the power of Christ's death and his resurrection. Um, we were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death, in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead, by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. Whoa. Okay. Let's, let's keep reading. I don't, I don't want to stop every verse. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. So when he died, we, we can actually die to sin just like he died. We can be raised to life like he was raised to life. We, we know, verse 6, we know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. For one who has died has been set free from sin. Now if we have died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. We know that Christ, being raised from the dead, will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. So you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. So, so catch that last part. Um, I mean, catch the whole thing. It's all, he's kind of repeating the same idea. You know, Christ died and we can 
die with him to our sins, to the punishment of our sin, and Christ was raised from the dead, we can also be raised to walk in newness of life with Christ. Um, and so, so don't, don't, so consider yourselves dead to sin. Don't, don't consider yourselves still alive to that thing that died on the cross with Christ. You're dead to that. In Christ, you have life. Um, anyway, it's a great passage to, if you guys want to look at it later, Romans 6, 4 through 11. Look at it. Anyway, um, so, so this, this is the gospel that we've been going through. It's that Christ died for our sins and rose from the dead. This is how he rose from the dead. Um, was in this, um, it, it was this thing that was seen by so many people as something that we can be identified with. And we can have true life. We don't have to live, we don't have to have an eternal death. We can have life eternal.